Hi, my name is Irene Stewart and I'm Retention Coordinator here at St. Clair College. My partner Marco Yovanovic will be our moderator today and I'm here today to talk to you about interactive learning objects with H5P. Today I'd like to talk to you about why you would use interactive exercises in the first place. I'd like to present some information about H5P Studio through eCampus Ontario and then I'd like to take you through about four easy examples of uh, interactive exercises that you can add to your courses. So one of the reasons I think it's important to consider using interactive exercises is because of the ways it can help remote learning students. So one of the things that I think interactive exercises can do for students is it can expand their, uh, expand their attention span. So for example, if you think about the advice we receive about how long videos should be, you know, try to keep your videos short. I think if you use interactive exercises as part of that video, you can extend their attention span to a longer video. I think the same thing is true for readings that they might have to do or other materials that you are pre presenting. By adding an interactive exercise, you can increase the amount of time that they spend with the material and in your Blackboard course. It also increases that interaction. So there's a little bit less of that passive stance that students can sometimes take when they are doing remote learning, where they just kind of read through your slides or read through the, the material that you've presented, but they're not really engaging in it. Here's another way that you can add some of that interaction. In many of our programs, the idea of encouraging students to do some reflection on what they're learning is key. And here is another way where we can encourage that reflection almost we, and we do that when we're in face-to-face -face classes, don't we? We have a discussion with students. We're going to pose some questions to them, ask them to, you may think, pair and share, for example, as an uh, active learning activity we would do in the classroom. We can replace some of that, maybe not to the full extent, but we can replace some of that experience in our remote learning courses through these interactive exercises for that reflection. I think the other thing that's really important for student, from the student point of view is these interactive exercises give them some immediate feedback. So it confirms their learning or confirms their understanding, maybe at somewhat of a surface level, but that can be encouraging to a student who's particularly those that are new to remote learning to have that opportunity to, to feel like or get some feedback around the idea, hey, I'm on the right track. So I think there are some simple ways that you can think about to use interactive exercises in your courses. Kind of the first thing that always comes to my mind is this idea of you can use these exercises to introduce terminology. I think this would be particularly helpful for those courses where you have international students, particularly our, our first semester international students for this spring. If you had, you know, five or ten key terms for each unit, you could build an interactive exercise around that, do it early in the material as a way of introducing, hey, here's some terminology you might not be familiar with that is going to be important for you to know as you move through this, uh, this module or this week's material. You can also use it to reinforce steps in a process. You can have students label a diagram or a chart. And I know that kind of our first instinct is uh, to think about maybe um, anatomy and physiology, to put up a picture of the, the skeleton and have people label all the different uh, bones in the body. Sure, that makes sense. But there's other applications of this idea of labeling a diagram. We could take, for example, a picture or an image of a classified income statement and have the students label all the different parts of that income statement. So it, you can think of diagram uh, really broadly and, and use that as a way of creating an exercise. 
We can also use it to classify and group items uh, and to present practice questions. So there's, there's many different ways we can incorporate these exercises into our courses. When I was working on uh, Thrives, you may or may not know that uh, um, I have been working for about two years now along with others in the Student Services Department on a, um, a course for first semester students called Thrives. And Thrive seeks to uh, help students transition into the college. And so I've created a number of these exercises for the modules in Thrives. And when I was designing those, I was trying to think of also some of the um, pedagogical reasons I would use these exercises. And so for Thrives in particular, I think about these things uh, when creating exercises. How can I break up the material that I'm presenting? And th that idea of chunking the material in a particular module into bite size or reasonable pieces, and then adding an interactive exercise to do kind of a summary of that particular set of material that the students have gone through. Um, I do think I use the constructivist model. I hope I've said that correctly. Uh, so one of the things I try to do also is to activate prior knowledge, get students thinking about what they may already know about the topic or about this material. Um, I really want to especially focus on addressing pain points in, uh, in a course or in a module. And I'm sure we all have pain points in our courses. We all have areas where we know this particular topic or this concept seems to be difficult for students to, to grasp. Um, creating an exercise around those pain points can be one way to help work st students through gaining the knowledge that they need to be able to move on to the next concept or topic. And finally, the other thing I like to do with these exercises is to review key takeaways. So instead of having like a list of key takeaways at the end of a particular model, what I've done instead is create an interactive exercise. It still reviews all of those most important things I want a student to take away from uh, this particular module, but it does it in a way that that has them interact with the information rather than just passively reading it. So another way of reinforcing and reviewing those key takeaways. So that all sounds great, but how are we going to make these exercises? Trying to program these objects ourselves in HTML5 requires technical knowledge that I don't have and I don't want to learn. So here's where H5P comes in. And I do want to answer Michelle's question. Anything you create in H5P can be imported later. So that's awesome. So H5P is a free open source collaboration framework. It's an abbreviation for HTML5 package. Uh, but what H5P is all about is making it easy for everyone to be able to create, share, and use this interactive content without needing to have all of the technical knowledge to be able to program these things in HTML5. So it, it was started by and created for educators. And uh, there is a, a very dynamic uh, community around H5P that you can access both in Ontario through eCampus Ontario as well as globally through h5p.org. There are already over 40 different types of content that you can make. Uh, the content is mobile friendly, so that if someone is using an iPad or their mobile phone, they're going to be able to access and use these activities. It can be embedded into Blackboard, which I think is really powerful. For those of the, uh, we should be concerned with accessibility standards, and they are working on making all 40 types of content accessible. At this time, at least 26 types are. And again, that main open source is h5p.org. Now, if you go to h5p.org, 
yes, Terry, the things that you create there are probably going to be available to everyone who comes on to that website. That's another reason why using H5P Studio is awesome because you have some ability to control whether or not it's going to be in their catalog or not. And I will show you how you can copyright your exercises both on h5p.org and h5p. Or h5p studio and then you can choose whether or not you want to license that in a way that others can use it and can share it. All right. So I was talking about what are some of the advantages um, I want you to know that eCampus Ontario is a nonprofit organization that is funded by the colleges and by the ministry, and its focus is on increasing access to online learning as well as providing uh, professional development opportunities for faculty. So if you haven't ever checked out eCampus Ontario, I really encourage you to. Uh, I took their Ontario Extend Professional Development Program, and I, I loved it. I, it was really fabulous, and I would encourage you to take a look at that. Because of their interest in supporting faculty in the Ontario post-secondary field, they have made H5P Studio available to all faculty at post-secondary institutions in Ontario for free. And as I mentioned before, one of the advantages is you have a place where your content can create, or your the content you created can live. Shoo. And I want to mention that because with Thrives, we've been doing the Thrives program since May of last year. So I had three sections last spring, I had nine in the fall, and I had four in the winter. That's a lot of different places. And Thrive stays open for two semesters for students. So if I had to make a correction to one of the exercises, the potential was I would have to make that correction in at least nine different places, if not more. I'm not going to do that. That's, that's too much work to go into every single Blackboard course and update every single one. By having it live in H5P Studio, I can go to that original exercise that I created, make any changes I need there, and it will automatically update the H5P exercise in all of my courses. I love that idea. A huge time saver from, from my perspective. So if you have multiple uh, courses and, or you may even have courses that are not necessarily the same course but you're using some of the same kind of content or the same exercises you only have to update it one place and then it will take care of that but the next time a student logs in and uses that exercise it's going to automatically go to that brand new content alrighty so through the studio version you have full access to all the content creation and you but you also have the ability to search what other faculty across Ontario have created if they've chosen to license it to share and have chosen to share it in the catalog which is great because many of those you can use just the way they've been created and embed those within your blackboard courses and others you can uh, you can take that and use that as a starting point to adapt it and modify it to make it your own. And we can do that through our ability to share our creations under Creative Commons license. And I did put or not there, so it is a choice. You can choose to license what you make under a Creative Commons license and make it available in the catalog, or you can choose not to make it available and not to allow other people to use it but I hope you will consider joining in the wider community that is trying to be more open and particularly if you use other people's creations that you would also be willing to share some of your own and help build up the catalog. I wanted to say a couple words about Creative Commons licenses in case you're not aware. So Creative Commons is a internationally active not-for-profit organization that provides free licenses. Uh, 
Creative Commons does not replace copyright law, it works within copyright law. So the idea of giving what you create a Creative Commons license is to give permission in advance of how you are going to allow other people across the world to use your work. So I think that's important. You don't give up your copyright with your Creative Commons license. What you do instead is you decide ahead of time how people can use your work and you give them permission to do that as opposed to requiring them to contact you and ask you for permission to reuse your work. Some Creative Commons licenses that you might see, the one in the top left corner, I think I can do the pointer here, this one here, is Creative Commons by, which means you're free to use that material that has been created as long as you give attribution. Another common Creative Commons license I see on educational educational material is this Creative Commons by share alike where the license says you're free to use this give me attribution because it was my work originally and when you create something new with it you're asked to also share it back into the world with the same license of buy share alike the one that I've used for most of the Thrives material that I have created is this license down here in the left hand bottom corner which is Creative Commons by give attribution share alike and non-commercial so you can you can do some different levels with your Creative Commons license um, this is the other one we often see Creative Commons where give attribution but you can't use it commercially and this one is a pretty restrictive license, but also available to you. This is Creative Commons by No Derivatives. So the idea here is that if you've created something, you're going to allow other people to use it freely as long as they make absolutely no changes, no derivatives. They have to use it just exactly as you have produced it. I see this quite often on uh, graphics. Um, infographics and uh, PDFs so that you're free to share them with your class and put them up on Blackboard but you can't make any changes to that document you have to leave it exactly the way it is if you have other questions about Creative Commons sometime in the future uh, you can contact me and I'm happy to talk about that also if you are looking for Creative Commons licensed information, I encourage you to contact our library staff as they can certainly help you search out and find Creative Commons open education resources that might be appropriate for your courses. Okay, just want to give a hot tip since we were talking about Creative Commons licenses. I also encourage you to check out eCampus's Ontario's open library because they have a catalog of fabulous OER textbooks that are appropriate for the Ontario post-secondary environment. And their website is openlibrary.ecampusontario.ca. So Patrick asked the question, what constitutes NC? Does education that charges dollars uh, considered non-commercial? Education institutions are considered non-commercial. I don't know if that, uh, answers your your question I would encourage you to take a look at the creativecommons.org uh, website and you can explore uh, their definitions about what non-commercial is a little more deeply Patrick all right we're at the question point again did I miss any important questions in the chat room Mr. Marco Pardon me. no I believe that you did uh, answer each of them Irene as they appeared awesome uh, does anyone else have a question that they, they would like to share? You can raise your hand and uh, come online and speak with us, or you're welcome to add a question in the chat room. Listen, uh, it's, this Steve uh, was wondering, actually, while we're waiting for uh, Patty's question, if I could just ask a sure. quick one. I was just going in this Go site and looking at the, um, the various uh, uh, elements, and uh, I went through the filtering, and I was able to find some interesting subject matter, but I'm finding that everything is very new 
like updated in the last five days or so. Is this a reflection? Is this a very new tool? Or I, I, my understanding was that it was a little older. So yes, actually, it's been around since 2013. That's yeah, when it first okay. began. So it's seven mm. years history for H5P. What's new is the access we have through eCanvas Ontario through H5P Studio. Okay. Okay. So the the studio is new, and that's why you're seeing quite a few uh, new exercises coming up. I, for example, I used well, Thrives actually has an open education resource textbook. And so I created all my original H5P Thrive exercises through Pressbooks. And that's where I originally linked. So I'm, I'm going to be transferring my exercises over to H5P Studio. Um, but yes, that's the part that's new is this ability for us as Ontario faculty to be able to use this utility. So if you post an exercise in H5P, do students access from there? Uh, what's the difference between having it there versus Blackboard? So if you do post an exercise in H5P, potentially you could share a link to it and have the students there, but I think it's better and more fun if you embed it directly into Blackboard. Uh, and I'm going to show you an example of how I would do that in Thrives. Uh, what I like about embedding the H5P exercises in Blackboard is that it keeps the student within your course and within your module. If you make it part of what they're doing online, that they can do that exercise right in Blackboard, uh, it keeps them engaged and keeps them moving through the material. Uh, that you have made available to them. I had talked about uh, labeling and I am going to do some exercises, Sean. So, so far you haven't missed anything. Yay. All right, if there aren't any other questions, I am going to continue on with my slides.